With a cast that includes dancing reapers to mutant soap operas, pathological apes and one very unruly goose, welcome to Get Indie Gaming and our rundown of our most loved indie games of 2019. Let's begin at number 20 with Astro Galasta, which came out in May via Steam and on iOS. Set in the late 16th century London, you play as Foreman, a cad of a man loosely based on the case notes and studies of a chap called Simon Foreman, a serial villain of sorts who died in 1611. Here you offer to help give hints and advise a magnificently diverse cast of characters who've arrived on Foreman's doorstep hoping to find guidance and counsel. Its caustic wit and delicious characterizations won our collective hearts within moments of its beginning. Highlights of the interactions include a lady of society who really isn't very good at hosting the parties she wants people to so enjoy, the discussions with the Archbishop of Whitgift, and a lady called Alice who rather likes her booze and bedroom gymnastics, although beneath such chaos you find a gentle soul looking for closure and a peaceful life. If you're after something that's just that little bit different, and don't mind a few subtle and not so subtle digs on the usual deferential role of the church and other historical grandees of the time, then this is something well worth taking a look at. At number 19, and from late February, Ape Out is a hyper-violent arcade shooter brawler which also happens to look incredible. The soundtrack is also one of the best and most recognisable of the year, with its jazz-led procedural generation and the drums, cymbals and other associated instruments of the genre that ebb and flows with the characters and antics of your character. Ape Out is certainly tough in places, and given the levels are generated on the fly, there's no chance of you being able to memorise where and when the human enemies will attack. I've been back to Ape Out numerous times over the year and each time, well it's been a delight to once again take control of this rampaging animal. Ape Out is available to play on home PC via Steam and on the Nintendo Switch. Coming up now at number 18, Felix the Reaper is a puzzle game with a backstory of love where you play as Felix who works for the Ministry of Death. It's up to you to make sure certain individuals meet their maker by manipulating the environment to ensure they die in a predefined way, many of which would be read at home within the Final Destination series of films. With a delicious voiceover from Sir Patrick Stewart, the use of professional dancers to model how Felix struts and dances his way around the levels, all together with the use of a dark and light puzzle mechanic, Felix the Reaper is one puzzler from the year that feels decidedly unloved. Up now at number 17, Kind Words is quite unlike anything we've ever played. Essentially a super casual multiplayer with almost none of the traditional mechanics usually associated with video games. It's just you at home in a smallish room with you writing and receiving letters from other people while accompanied by laid back lo-fi beats and while on paper it shouldn't really work, it's absolutely delightful. It's all anonymous, which you might think would be a recipe for Troll City, and yet so far, I've seen almost none of this type of disruption within the growing community. In terms of offering players such an enriching, anonymous and uplifting experience, we've compared it both to Journey and Sky from that game company. It's honestly something worth getting hold of. Kind Words came out in mid-September for home PCs. If you want to know what the web was kind of like around the turn of the century, then Hypnospace Outlaw manages to create an almost flawless visual and oral representation of the web from way back when. While it delivers a mountain of nostalgia, it's really a modern day piece of satire that plays in a similar way to say those games of Papers, Please and Orwell, while also providing a testing puzzler that's frankly tough as nails in places. You're tasked with acting as a moderator or enforcer on an online hub called Hypnospace. 
It's your job to take down trolls, hackers, viruses and other dodgy things such as copyright violation. While things begin at a gentle pace, the difficulty ramps up soon enough and you'll need to use deductive reasoning and every now and again some guesswork to figure out what's going on. While clearly a work of fiction, there's many a metaphor in here on the goings on within our current online existence. It's a game to savour and enjoy while also looking hard into its underlying themes. Coming up at number 15, What the Golf is the most fun I've ever had, playing a game that's loosely associated to a sport in which I can genuinely find almost nothing enjoyable or fun about it, aside from being outside on a decent walk. It's a physics-based sports game with environmental puzzle elements that while it might look silly, it's hugely entertaining with plenty more going under the hood that you might expect. Our number 14, and while out this past year, it's sadly no longer available with it having been pulled from Steam in late February, only a few days after its release following the discovery of assets within the game that were allegedly derogatory to certain Chinese officials. While relatively short, this remains our favourite psychological horror of the year. Its use of the first person, while similar to that of say Gone Home or Edith Finch, the atmosphere and devotion creates anything but. For the most part, you control a screenwriter through an apartment block in which the rooms represent different years of the writer's family within the 1980s. As a horror game, the frights when they come are at times rather delicate, although still have the power to unsettle. I'd also recommend playing this if you're able to with headphones as the intensity of the audio really does magnify what devotion is able to do. As you should expect, Devotion is suitably dark, and while some sections are stronger than others, and it's also easy to miss out on some of the collectibles needed to fully understand some of the backstory, the game still has the power to make us feel unsettled when thinking about it all these months later. At number 13, a place in this countdown that no doubt for some will be a travesty, Disco Elysium is a modern take on dice rolling games of old, where you play as a broken former detective who's clearly seen better days. The hand-drawn art style is painterly in its nature and reminds us of oil on canvas with it being an assault on the senses. Visually, it's nothing short of stunning. While there's also no denying it's all very cleverly written, we can't ever recall having the depth of conversations we've had with NPCs in any RPG over the past couple of years or perhaps ever. However, not all of the conversations flow so well. Some of the pacing is off tempo, with plenty of uneven sections and rhythm breaks where signposting of what to do next falls somewhat flat. We also struggle to gel with the characters and the type of story and associated themes and we agreed that as wishy-washy as this sounds, because it is, there's a lot in the game we don't enjoy particularly to place it any higher in our end of year indie game rundown. Mistakes. Up now at number 12, Tangle Tower came out in late October and is all about a murder mystery which is elements of Ace Attorney games and Professor Layton. You go about interrogating the folks who live within a tower with the view of finding out who killed the victim and in doing so you can picture a strange and yet totally convincing tale of discovery and intrigue. What sets this one apart from other visual type novels, well it isn't just the story and interactions you have with the NPCs, but how the characters, animations and voice acting have risen the bar for those that follow to such an extent well, this one really feels like it's taken these sort of games from an artistic perspective upwards to a new level of sophistication. Playing Tangle Tower feels like jumping into an animated film that you're able to direct and control, which is what it ultimately is. And there were times where we forgot we were playing a game at all, which if you think about it, well, that's one heck of a fine achievement. At number 11, and one of the games alongside what the golf we've had most fun playing with on Apple Arcade, is the adorable but sparse looking Bleak Sword. While hardly revolutionary, Bleak Sword with it being a retro looking classic hack and slash brawler, what it does offer though is a brutal mix of action 
with the most challenging and fun boss battles we've ever played on a mobile platform. Sure, it doesn't look overly pretty, but that doesn't matter. The nine levels where you can build your character's abilities as you progress all feel measured and there's a fine difficulty progression from start to finish. The controls are so simple. You attack, dodge and use your shield by way of swiping or tapping the screen. There are easy comparisons to be made here with other tough fighter based games, although we think it's best to hold off doing so. We will however call out this is possibly more fun to be had here than could really be expected on a mobile platform. And yes, you do die over and over again, but once you recognise the enemy movement patterns you can get working on taking care of business. For fighty games on mobiles, there's nothing to rival it. At the halfway point in this year's countdown, Untitled Goose Game has been a delight to watch over the course of its development and the finished product doesn't disappoint. As many of you will already know, you play as a moody goose and are tasked with completing a to-do list which comprises of generally annoying the inhabitants of what seems to be a rather sleepy English village. You go about upsetting a gardener, stealing a boy's toy before making him buy it back again from a shopkeeper and plenty more. With a simple piano led audio that features a variation of Debussy's preludes together with paired back sounds which are totally in keeping with the village environment, there's plenty of joy here to be had amongst the chaos. Untitled Goose Game is available on home PC and the Switch, with ports expected soon onto the PlayStation 4 and the Xbox. Next up at number 8, Neo Cab is a visual novel in which we explore how the expanding gig economy might look and shape our lives within the near distant future. It also peers into a view of a time where big technology firms have more power and gravitas over people's daily lives than they do today. Neo Cab tells the story of Lena, who works as one of the last human drivers for hire when nearly everyone else has been replaced by driverless alternatives. Over the course of an in-game week, you collect a number of passengers each night and it's up to you to chat with them by way of the dialogue choices offered as the journey goes along. As a visual novel, Neo Cab succeeds in the narrative and where it directs the player to cast a more careful eye on where we as society are headed and if not, we're almost there already. Up next at number 9 and the only couch co-op focused game to make the rundown, Eve Ho sees you and up to three others having the simple task of getting from point A to point B without dying. It's that good that for much of the year Heave Ho replaced the Overcooked series as our number one party game. It's just so very silly and fun from the moment you start playing. Like Overcooked, it's really easy for it to cause the odd argument here and there when players make mistakes or are careless causing other players to fall to their doom. Hey, it's not perfect. Some levels are perhaps just a little bit too tricky, although if you take too long, the game does give you an easy option to finishing things off which you can take or leave. Heave Ho came out in August on home PC and the Nintendo Switch. Coming at number 7, Gatto Roboto with its black on white colouring is striking within its overall visual simplicity. It's short and can be completed in an evening or perhaps over a weekend if you are looking to go on and finish everything it has to offer. The boss battles can be particularly fiddly affairs in places, although as pattern based encounters you can learn what's going on and counter accordingly. One brief note of caution. There's not much going on from a story perspective aside from the crazy scientist kind of thing and if you're not already a paid up member of the Metroid fan club then this one's unlikely to change your mind. That being said, we loved it and have no issues placing it within the best of our year countdown. From March our number 6, Baba Is You is certainly different. While most puzzle games have you playing with things in the environment which help guide you to and ultimately solve the problem at hand, Baba Is You does something that hasn't been done before. 
Not only can you manipulate things you find within the levels, you are also able to alter and change the rules the game follows. These rules present themselves as blocks of text, and pushing them around, say to change lava is melt to lava is float, the previously unpassable fiery impasse that was blocking your progression is now hovering over your head, therefore allowing you to pass. With over 200 different puzzles, this is all about taking a methodical approach with a good dose of lateral thinking. Up now and beginning the top 5 indie games of 2019, Mutazioni came out in the third quarter of the year onto Steam and the PlayStation 4. Pitched as a mutant soap opera, with it looking over a number of themes ranging from managed decay, healing processes, the impact of socialisation within small communities and amongst other things, a story about personal growth into adulthood, it offers so much within its 5 or 6 hour playtime. You play as Kai, who takes a trip from the mainland to Mutazioni to visit her grandfather who's gravely ill. Over the course of a week and having initially helped him back to health, you begin to learn more about your grandfather, the other folks on the island and their individual and collective stories. One of the defining storylines comes from the overall process and associated steps we take during grief and loss, which is handled with more nuance, subtlety and subject mastery than I can ever recall seeing outside of an academic environment. This became abundantly clear in the section of this storyline where you use your skills to regrow the character's long abandoned garden to help her find solace and to an extent an element of closure. You grow a number of these gardens during your time on the island and the planting aspects are in themselves a rewarding experience where you're free to have a play to see what work and what doesn't. The soundtrack of these sections and the overall sedate nature of these scenes is so very calming and peaceful. Unlike nearly everything at play here is so cleverly and deftly put together. At number 4, Sayonara Wild Hearts is a game that's honestly best thought of in terms of being part interactive music installation and part video game. The tunes are expressive, catchy pop with techno chip tune elements that work hand in hand with the overall artistic aesthetic. While you are on rails the whole time, there's almost always a feeling of speed and graceful movement. It effortlessly leaps from genre to genre with one moment you're playing a rhythm based dance fight off to next a side scroller, to a semi first person shooter and loads more. The levels are brief and intense and offer a great sense of accomplishment when Queen Latifah hollers gold rank at the end of the level. Its art style with the animations and accompanying soundtrack make this what it is and also like Journey, I'll be playing this from time to time for as long as I'm playing video games. Welcome to Wilmot's Warehouse, a game for people who love to organise things. At number 3 and out late August on PC and Nintendo Switch, Wilmot's Warehouse comes from developers Ricky Haggett and Richard Hogg, with it published by the wonderful folks at Finji. Described as a puzzle game for people who really like to organise stuff, you of course play as Wilmot, the employee at A5 Logistics, who's responsible for organising, storing and stacking all of the products within the firm's warehouse. How you go about organising the products is up to you, be this via their colour, product type or any other format you choose to use. It's of course totally up to you, but be warned, in what feels eerily similar to reports of the workings of Amazon's behemoth storage areas, if you are too slow in locating items when they are requested at the service hatch, you won't receive the coveted performance stars you need to secure various upgrades with which to improve the warehouse overall. There's something quite therapeutic when you nail a set of delivery instructions through you knowing where everything is and vice versa when things go all a little bit blank. The end when it comes, spoiler ahead, with Wilmot getting fired to be replaced by a fully automated picking system, well it does feel harsh and unexpected Although in hindsight, what a wonderful way to bring about closure. 
In this year's runners-up position, we have Slay the Spire. While this one came out early in the year, it passed us by until a month or so before we sat down to pull together a shortlist for this video. A viewer had asked why we hadn't covered this one before, so we decided to pick it up and as a small collective, we're so very glad we did. In this game, you go about moving up a tower while killing off various monsters in what has to be one of the best card deck building games of the current generation. Having chosen your base character from a number of different classes, you begin with a small deck you build on and expand as you win in which turn makes you more powerful. Should you lose a battle, however, well, it's down to the bottom of the tower you go. It's hugely addictive, with each playthrough offering something different and affording you the chance to adapt and work on your battle strategies. In a single word, Slay the Spire is a triumph, and there's only one game out all year we like playing just that little bit more. Listen, uh... I need you to do me a favor, okay? So here we go. The number one indie game we played this 2019 is Telling Lies from Sam Barlow and is to date the quintessential full motion video game. This brief overview is spoiler free, although it concerns the contents of a hard drive that has a collection of videos, phone calls and hidden camera captures. The video clips are all between 45 seconds and up to nine minutes in duration. It's all about going through the footage and calls to join the dots together piece by piece to figure things out. We played this together as a small team and also individually, each of us noting down page after page of notes and character observations. It largely comes down to collecting words and phrases and it can be easy to miss things here and there, so playing this without concentrating fully isn't advisable. When you do make a connection, each one comes with that little aha sort of moment. As necessary within these video motion games, the acting needs to be spot on and yep, that's the case here. Each of the actors deliver a top notch performance that feel, well they feel wonderfully real and true to life. The only issue we all agreed upon comes from the inability to drag a video timeline to a specific point, although that really is looking for the cracks. It's brilliant and having played through it on numerous occasions, the small team that makes Get Indie Gaming, well we're proud to say Telling Lies is our most loved indie game we played in all of 2019. So which were your favourite indie games you played this year? Let us know down below and please, if you liked the video, please click that like button and if you haven't done so already, now is a fine time to subscribe to stay up to date with indie game news, reviews and features. Many thanks for watching, we look forward to welcoming you all back here soon for more indie game videos.